Patricia Mokhtarian is from Davis, and I was just speaking with her. She has a very entertaining uh, career where she began in a relatively dry field of mathematics and operations research, but now she's studying human behavior in relationship to traffic patterns and congestion. And as you can see, she has this rather evocative um, title for her seminar, which I'm sure goes over quite well at a cocktail party, because we're always wondering, right, as we sit on the Bay Bridge, looking at another person going at 0 0.05 miles per hour, why we're doing this in one car in six lanes of traffic. And I think uh, a combination of mathematics and human behavior is something that Patricia is going to explain to us today. So in our usual f format, let's give her a round of applause for coming all the way from Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Is my mic as on as it's going to be? Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and hello, all of you out there in cyberspace. And um, I'm going to, in the next 40 minutes or so, probably give you an overview of something like 75% of my life's work. And so, notwithstanding that it's still a short life so far, um, that's still a lot of ground to cover. So I'm not going to give you mathematical equations per se, but I will give you kind of headlines behind which is a lot of research, both my own and others. I assume this talk gets posted on the web, I think. Yep. So at the end, there's two slides full of further reading, if you're so inclined. And on my website, you'll find titles and abstracts and, in some cases, full texts of most of my publications and reports and so on. So you're welcome to um, browse and to ask me questions um, if you have any. So, well, why are we still traveling when, in fact, we can telecommunicate? First of all, it's useful to remember that we've been telecommunicating for quite a while now. So back in the dawn of history, we were communicating by sound, whether tom-tom drums or church bells or um, shofars or whatever. Um, we used sight to communicate at a distance, whether signal flags on ships or flares on hilltops or smoke signals or that's supposed to be a mirror signal. I'm not sure if you can tell. Um, and, okay, the written word came along somewhere in there, and that, of course, expanded our ability to communicate at a distance. We could transmit books or letters or documents of some kind. And now, of course, relatively recently compared to how long we've been telecommunicating, along comes electronic communications in a vast number of forms and uh, improving all the time. So um, these have increased our ability to telecommunicate by orders of magnitude. And um, it's not that we're just now thinking about wouldn't it be nice if we could reduce travel with telecommunications. That's actually been part of the motivation from the beginning. If you think about that um, church bell ringing, um, it was saving some messenger a lot of travel to have to run around and tell everybody face to face to come to the church, something exciting was about to happen. Or similarly for a trumpet in battle and so forth. Um, so there's always been that motivation, but uh, it's become even more explicit uh, in relatively modern times. As long ago as 1879, there were letters to the editor and articles in the London Spectator and the Times. Mind you, um, the telephone, at least Alexander Graham Bell's version, was invented somewhere around 1876. So very soon after the invention of the telephone, we were seeing speculation that, mm, you know, this might save business travel and so forth. Um, the science fiction authors, again, back in the 1800s and early 1900s, were talking about uh, this wonderful idea, or not so wonderful as if you read these two stories, um, the telecommunications activity there is indeed uh, eliminating travel or reducing travel substantially, but mm, you get the impression that that was not considered a good thing, um, by these authors at least. But I love H.G. Wells' Kineto telephotograph, which, you know, long before video conferencing was a reality, was exactly what he had in mind. Well, okay, stepping um, a little closer to the present, um, even as early as the 1960s, we have articles in the transportation literature speculating on the ability of telecommunications to reduce travel. And again, one of the earliest ones that I've been able to find is on the reference list at the end. Okay, so we know that telecommunications can reduce travel, and since the usage of telecommunications is looking something like this, I apologize that I didn't have the time to go out to 2006 at least, 
Um, but if you look at just cell phone calls, uh, cell phone subscribers and international phone calls and toll phone calls, and add to that internet subscribers and any other metric of telecommunications that you can think of, it's certainly going up and up at a relatively exponential rate. So lots of telecommunicating going on. So if it's substituting for travel, surely um, transportation must have pretty much disappeared by now. And of course, we know that's not true. Um, again, only out to 2000, but and there may have been some little jiggles with the pre and post 9-11 recession and so forth in 2001. But we're still on an upward trajectory on net and doing nothing but increasing the amount of travel that we do by any metric, again, any mode pretty much other than transit, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and of course, a more familiar way of looking at transportation. And here's a, a little chart from the uh, TTI, Texas Transportation Institute, does an annual uh, urban congestion report, so to speak. And um, there are some quibbles you could have with their methodology and so forth. But however, they're measuring what they're measuring. It's going up. You know, In 1982, they were talking about 0.8 billion hours of total delay. This is nationwide. They have a separate set of charts for urban areas above a million, but this is a similar you know, trends. Uh, so the total amount of delay is increasing and the amount of delay in um, you know, extreme conditions is increasing as a share of total delay. So why? And so what I want to do in the next few minutes is to, first of all, give you my reasons for believing that you know, telecommunications is not going to reduce travel on net. And I have nine of them so far. Maybe you'll come up with more. If you do, let me know. Um, but, okay, do we have any hope whatsoever that ICT, I will use as an abbreviation for Information and Communication Technology, um, can it reduce travel at all? Do we have any reason to think? And, okay, I have three reasons to give us a little hope, um, but only three against nine. And finally, very briefly at the end, I'll mention some of the challenges associated with um, the findings that we have so far. So number one reason out of nine is that ICT is not always a feasible alternative. And I think it's easy to overlook that, especially if we're working in the field of developing new technologies and you know, very uh, starry-eyed about how exciting it all is. But in many cases, um, the infrastructure is simply not there yet. If you think about um, broadband access, broadband internet access, um, yeah, something like, what, 75, 80% of the U.S. population has it, but not all. Um, and even, you know, anecdotally in my building on UC Davis campus, I cannot get cell phone access, so that certainly cramps my style with respect to mobile communications um, and tells you that we're a second-tier market over there in <laughs> Davis, Sacramento. Um, but even if the infrastructure is there, the service that you need to use it might not be available. If you think about e-shopping, um, you know, the network is there to offer e-shopping, but online grocery shopping is still certainly not ubiquitous. Again, it is present in some places and has come and gone in other places, um, but there are still, it's still fairly limited the extent to which you can order groceries online these days. And even if the service is there, the infrastructure is there, um, the service might not be available for the event that you're talking about replacing with ICT. So if you think about your typical um, business conference or professional society meeting, there's usually not a true video conferencing alternative. You may have a website with papers posted before, during, after. You may even have some videos. Uh, but that's not the same as being there in real time and being able to ask questions of the speaker in real time. So that's number one. Um, number two is that even if ICT is available and feasible, it might not be a desirable substitute for travel. And here's where I think many of us realize this in our heart of hearts, and I want to get a little audience participation here. And before I give you my list, just ask you, why do you think ICT would not always be a desirable substitute for travel? Think about whatever scenario you want to, a business conference or telecommuting versus going to work or e-shopping versus uh, going to a store. Why do you still travel? Yes? So, would you elaborate? Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, cultural change. Uh huh. And uh, the path is, I mean, we've beaten the field. People are comfortable following the path. They don't feel comfortable with an eye to eye and culturally handshaking and whatever they're doing and interacting. They just haven't gotten to the point where they can do a shift. 
Okay. Okay. So cultural reasons. So do you think um, we're just not we haven't gotten in the habit yet, or is there something more enduring than? This is your talk with that. Just curious. Keeping in touch with the people out there. Um, you had one. Yeah. Oh, let me just run them. Sure. Thanks. I, I find that vendors will not reply except in person. They will not answer phone calls except by machine and do, will not answer questions about their services. Okay, so sometimes you just get better service by going and pounding on doors and putting your face in someone else's. Yep. Out of sight, out of mind. Simply travel is fun. A lot of people enjoy seeing a new place and, you know, if a company pays for you to go visit a place you've never been, you know, take the family, take the weekend and just enjoy the travel. Okay, exactly. And I've got a whole other slide on travel being fun, so we'll come back to why that's true later. Other thoughts? Well, I think we've hit on a number of them here, you know, location amenities. So if that conference is in Mallorca, hey, I'd a lot rather go to Mallorca than teleconference. You know, there have been a couple of occasions where I've been invited to video conference to some place exotic. And I've always felt a little bit just, you know, resentful because I had all the work to do of preparing the talk and none of the fun of being in an exciting location. So I think a lot of us, and obviously there um, is a limit. So I think uh, that there's sort of an optimum amount of travel that many of us find ideal. And that, of course, will be a different amount for different people. and different for the same person at different stages in her life. But um, for many of us, you know, traveling, uh, one more, making one more trip at the margin is actually a desirable thing for, again, a lot of these reasons. The co-presence with other people, so again, just the need for um, a handshake or a <laughs> fist in the face or whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, objects, again, we sometimes still need to be physically present with objects, whether it's a specialized piece of equipment or still some paper files that aren't available online and so forth. Um, you know, going to a far off location may offer opportunities to make side trips to, again, other scenic locations or to family members or to friends. Um, and a more local level, um, we sometimes uh, don't care about replacing a store trip because the store is right on the way to something else we were going to anyway. So it's no big deal to stop there. So even if I could um, buy whatever it is on the internet, why should I? The marginal cost to me of doing it in the store is trivial. Um, just getting out of our routine. So for some people, just getting out of the office and going somewhere is desirable. Um, and sometimes it's a very useful escape, isn't it? <laughs> and so certainly lots of people commute to get out of the house. <laughs> uh, lots of people go on that business trip, I'm really sorry, honey, but I've just got to go, uh, when in fact they're actually very relieved to be going. Um, travel can be a signal of status. So the more you travel, the busier you are, the more important you are. And so we need to demonstrate that by traveling. And I think most of us, uh, if possible, would prefer to have an authentic authentic experience over a virtual one, and that again means being there rather than um, doing it electronically. So um, another thing then to understand related to that is that not all uses of ICT are going to eliminate travel. And again, I think it's tempting to just view ICT as a substitute and automatically think, well, if I did it by ICT, I saved a trip. But of course, that's often not true. In many cases, the alternative is not traveling to the activity, but instead not conducting the activity at all. So if you think about distance learning, sure, some people will actively choose a distance learning opportunity over the traditional enrollment and coming to a campus and sitting in a physical classroom. But I would bet you for many more people, it makes the difference between being able to get the educational experience at all and not. And so it's simply making the opportunity available for more people than would be able to take advantage of it otherwise. Some uh, internet shopping is impulse shopping and or buying something specialized that you know you can only get over the internet or at least you know you can't get in a local store. And so the alternative is not to go to a local store and find it because you simply know it's not going to be there, but rather to not have that item at all. 
And if you think about email, um, we certainly don't make trip, you know, wouldn't have made a trip uh, to replace every email message that we receive. And certainly, if you think about the broadcasting and forwarding capabilities of email, again, I would bet money that you know the, uh, a high, very high fraction of the email that we receive is simply additional communication that otherwise would not have occurred. Certainly, not replacing a trip to make the same, convey the same information. So um, when you stop and think about it then, I like to think of uh, communications as being divisible into these three modes, if you will. We talk about modes in transportation, so these are modes of communication. And so face-to-face -face travel of individuals or sending some item that conveys information like a letter or a book or a, even a physical disc or a CD or something like that. Um, and then, of course, electronic transmission, telecommunications. So I think it's quite possible that um, with increasing technology capabilities that we're um, increasing the share of electronic communications that are occurring at the expense of both personal travel and sending uh, information objects, if you will. But the whole pie is getting bigger at the same time uh, for some of the reasons that we've already talked about and some of the other reasons that we're going to talk about. And so if you look at the total sort of absolute amounts of personal travel, you know, the red wedge is bigger than the black wedge, even though its share of total communication is smaller, the total amount of travel in absolute terms is bigger. So that's the way I see it in some simplified terms. But now, this issue of travel carrying some positive utility. And I want you to know that real people understand this, um, but in our profession in transportation, uh, we teach our students in every course they take, and you read it in you know, half the journal articles even that you read, travel is a derived demand, meaning that we don't travel for its own sake, we travel in order to get to some activity that we want to perform that's somewhere else. Well, I think we know better with respect to vacation travel or holiday travel. And one of the things that got me interested in this positive utility of travel kick is realizing how much of our leisure activities are, in fact, themselves travel. So when you think about it, skiing and sailing and hang gliding and, and cave exploration and scuba diving and hiking and, you know, all of these things that we choose actively to spend our limited spare time on are travel for the sake of travel. So the question for me became to what extent um, are the reasons that we do those things transferable to our daily ordinary travel that we have to do kind of a thing. Um, so again, let's brainstorm a little bit. Why do you think we need to travel or want to travel for its own sake, not just for the utility of getting from A to B? Yes. Uh, I think we get into an altered state of consciousness. Uh, that happens for me when I take a transcontinental rail journey, for example. Okay, so I would um, recast that as uh, mental therapy or, you know, it's just uh, soothing, it can be, or um, exposing us to new experiences. Yep, great. Well. I, I th I'll just throw in one. Chime in. You know, it, yeah, it, it's kind of just the adventure sometimes to get to point A to point B. Okay, yeah. Are we not adventure-seeking? Are we not variety-seeking creatures? Um, do we not have a need for conquest, whether it's our own fears or sense of inadequacy or somebody else, as the case may be? But conquest is certainly accounted for a lot of travel down through history uh, and our space travel, for example. Yeah. I'd put in the serendipity of meeting pleasant people. Great, yeah. So just, again, I, that may be part of the adventure thing, but just uh, see what happens. And uh, I would add to it curiosity. So what is out there? Um, and that can account for, oh, let's go for a ride after dinner to see that new housing development on the other side of town, all the way to, well, I've always wanted to go to India or whatever. Um, people are spending millions of dollars to be space tourists, you know, to go up in the space and you know what's that about well it's just all the things we're talking about other thoughts before i flash my entire list at once 
So things like uh, aesthetic considerations might lead me to take a longer route uh, than I would otherwise or to choose a more distant destination than I would otherwise. Um, some people are speed demons, but even just the sensation of movement itself, whether fast or slow, riding your bike um, can give you that sensation of motion that I think we need at some level. If you think about traveling in the womb for nine months and the papooses on the back and the cradle rocking and so forth, um, you know, it's pretty much embedded in us to be soothed or to get something beneficial out of motion. Uh, we talked about the symbolic value, the status symbol, uh, the escape value, and not just mental therapy, but physical. If you're talking about biking, walking, etc., that can certainly be a reason for traveling for its own sake in an environmentally benign way, unlike some of these others. But um, in any case, you get the idea. So um, again, this was sort of a revelation maybe to some people in the transportation profession, but it certainly accounts for a fair amount of explanation for why ICT is not replacing travel because in many cases we simply want to make that trip and it certainly accounts for why some people don't um, telecommute when in fact they can. I found this new word a couple of years ago and just loved it because it expressed exactly what I've been talking about. So in the psychology literature, they're very familiar with the word autotelic and meaning, you know, self meaning auto and telos meaning goal or purpose. And so travel can be autotelic, that is undertaken for its own sake. Um, and as I said earlier, I think many of those uh, characteristics that explain why we do enjoy skiing, sailing, flying, etc., cetera, um, will apply to our directed travel, resulting in, okay, in some cases, trips that don't have to be made, i.e., people who commute when they could telecommute. You know, by the way, it turns out that not everybody has a terrible commute. Again, we think in stereotypes. And we think well, that if I don't have a bad commute, I must obviously be the exception because look, you know, on television and the radio, you hear everybody else has a terrible one. But it turns out when you ask people um, what's the you know, most serious problem facing society or facing your region today, transportation or congestion is usually pretty near the top of the list, if not at the top. But then when you ask them, is congestion a problem for you personally? Guess what? You know, less than half say that it is. Okay, there's still a big chunk for whom it is, and I don't, you know, downplay that. Um, but again, in many cases, people's commute is not all that bad. In fact, it plays a positive role of escape and buffer between home and work, and you know, pleasant uh, ways to uh, use the time and productive ways and so forth. So we'll come back to that theme later too. Um, but, of course, there's, in most cases, trips that we do have to make, but again, this positive utility of travel can lead us to choose destinations that are farther away than we had to choose, um, may uh, motivate us to choose modes that um, fulfill those needs for independence or status or speed, and may lead us to choose routes that are longer than necessary. <coughs> so, again, all of these are contributing to increasing travel, um, not decreasing it. Well, reason number five is that ICT does save time. If you think about telecommuting, then you may save a good hour a day in commuting time. Uh, what are you going to do with that time? Some of the time you save might be spent in other activities that, guess what, involve travel. Now, we've thought about this for a long time as a possibility, but it turns out that, as, at least as far as we can tell with telecommuting, that does not seem to be a big effect. And so we've done travel diaries and this and that, lots of measurements of telecommuters before and after. And, and so it seems like for the most part, well, if you think about it, they're generally traveling too much anyway. They are long distance commuters, and so they're very happy to stay put you know, for eight or nine hours a day on their telecommuting days. And if they do make additional trips, they're short and, and uh, maybe walking or biking, et cetera. So we have not found any empirical evidence that telecommuters, for example, um, increase their non work travel substantially, which was a hypothesis to be checked. But certainly at the margin, it's possible, and so I include it as um, a conceptual possibility. But moving right along, one effect that is quite real is that ICT technologies are making travel more efficient, saving time, not you know, time of other activities, but time of travel itself. And so the more I save time, that's going to lower the cost of traveling to me. So simple economics says, lower the cost, demand goes up. 
And so this can happen both at the system level and at the personal level. Again, time doesn't permit going through all these, but many of you are probably more familiar with them than I am. All of these applications of ICT are helping to improve the functioning of the transportation system as a whole, and again, thereby in speeding up travel, making, uh, increasing the effective capacity of the transportation system, and thereby, guess what, accommodating more travel. Um, at the personal level, if you think about the kinds of things we can do while traveling, so talking on the phone, working on the laptop, surfing the web, um, then all of these activities are at a minimum going to reduce our motivation to save travel time because travel time is not so bad. You know, I'm having fun or I'm getting work done or whatever. Um, and at the margin, it might actively increase our travel. There's a few humorous uh, 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 examples of this in a moment, but one sort of benign way in which it might increase travel is that I might be motivated to choose a longer transit commute over driving alone because I can use the transit time productively. So here's, I don't think you can see this very well, but the young man at the bus stop is actually playing Sudoku on his electronic game thing, but he might just as easily have been, you know, calling a friend or doing some work. Um, and it says the average wait for a city bus is 12.8 minutes. Do something with your nothing. And so he is much more inclined to ride the bus when he's entertained uh, than if he's sitting there twiddling his thumbs or looking very bored like this poor woman there in her heels and so forth. So, and here's my e uh, commute is 25 emails long, so I can get lots of work done during my commute, although it does say uh, send your email from the sidewalk and check your calendar from the bus so you're not doing email in your car now, are you? But uh, maybe you will be, if not already. Um, and maybe a less benign version of how our travel might increase is that if I can save some time by teleconferencing for my routine business meetings, you know, the monthly meetings of the mid-level managers that I really don't have to be there in person for, um, if I can now video conference those, well, guess what? Again, I've saved more time that I can now use to spend going out meeting new clients, um, solidifying those business relationships, all those things that I need to be there in person for or that I want to do, you know, so I can take more discretionary trips. So again, at the margin, um, my ability to save time by ICT is freeing time that I am likely to spend um, traveling in other ways. Let's also then not forget that ICT is going to directly stimulate additional travel. And Paul and I were talking about this at the beginning, saying um, that, yeah, there's a synergistic effect. Now I can uh, meet a lot more people. My personal network is bigger. And so guess what? They're going to come see me. I'm going to go see them. Thing, one thing leads to another. Um, so if you think back to those first slides where I was saying that you know we had in mind saving travel from the beginning, even the church bells and the Trump it's calling the people to battle. Um, it's easy to focus on the messenger and saying, yeah, we saved the messenger travel, but what about the message? The message was come to the church or come to the uh, you know, battle. Uh, something's about to happen. And so we were summoning people to travel. And of course, it's not lost on students of communication history that one of the very first reported telephone conversations was, do you know? Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. So this is Alexander Graham Bell. So what did he do? Generated a trip. Okay. <laughs> it was only down the hallway in that case, but, you know, expand that. And a lot of telecommunications is of that same ilk. You know, come over here. I need you. Or, you know, we've got to work this out in person. And again, prior to ICT per se, down through the centuries, we've had travel writing and art and photography whose uh, main purpose, or at least one main purpose, was to stimulate interest and curiosity about exotic parts of the world and thereby stimulate people to want to go see them. So now, you know, multiply that many fold by the internet and it's just easier than ever to learn about interesting places and people and activities and so forth. And so um, certainly the, the curiosity is peaked, the desire is stimulated to go see them. Um, so here's my example of that. The woman is saying, hey, if I took pictures of the baby and emailed them to the in-laws, maybe they wouldn't visit as often. Wait. 
what if that just made them want to visit more? <laughs> so she was trying to reduce their travel, but in fact, it was probably going to be stimulating it when she shows them pictures of the baby. So, and then last but not least on this one, if you think about ICT's role in facilitating the globalization of commerce in particular and life in general, again, uh, the more far flung our contacts become and the more distributed our manufacturing, distribution, retailing, et cetera becomes, the more travel of both goods and people are going to be required to um, keep that going. So number eight. Um, ICT permits travel to be sold more cheaply, so it's not only saving us travel time, it's saving us travel money. And uh, if you think about all these things, ability to make price comparisons on different airlines and different uh, service providers, alerting me when the price drops below my threshold, and last minute bargains um, to fill seats that otherwise would go unfilled, these are techniques that are pretty much were impossible until the internet came along. But now they are there and have many different impacts. Number one, on a given trip, it may end up being cheaper than I expected it to be because I found a bargain on the internet. So what am I gonna do with that money I save? Might spend some of it at least on more travel. Or I may say, well, my travel budget is this much, so I'm gonna spend this much, but hey, now instead of going you know, 500 miles, I can go 5,000 miles. I found a really good deal. So I may take a longer trip, more travel. Um, and at the margin, again, uh, it's going to make tr affordable travel more accessible to more people, so it's going to stimulate entirely new trips at that fringe of the market who otherwise would have been priced out of it. So um, all those reasons now bring us to the last one, which is more long-term and indirect than the others have been. Um, but it certainly stands to reason that ICT is facilitating the shift, a shift, some shift, to more decentralized land patterns. And of course, then those tend to promote dependence on the automobile as opposed to public transit and more dispersed destinations and therefore, again, more vehicle travel. Now, I hasten to say that ICT also facilitates centralization and increased densification. There's this nice little counter stream in the urban planning and sort of architectural design literature that says, you know, imagine the skyscraper without the telephone. You know, it would simply be inconceivable to have the level of communication that would be needed. All the messenger boys <laughs> that used to be carrying messengers back and forth, messages back and forth, you know, would just be impossible with that centralized um, a set of employment. So the point there is that technology is neutral. In fact, it can be used in multiple ways, and we actually have a choice in how we choose to apply it. We can choose to use it to help centralize and densify, or we can um, choose to use it in the opposite way. And just to digress a little to show you my favorite cartoon about that, the two cave people are looking at the bonfire and one is saying to the other, very impressive, but what if the wrong people get their hands on it? And so, unfortunately, the wrong people always get their hands on technology. And our challenge is to figure out whether it's worth it or can we uh, minimize the negative uh, externalities or impacts of that technology. But in truth, you know, decentralization has many causes, and so it is a little bit challenging, if not downright impossible, to attribute you know, a certain sliver of the causality to ICT above and beyond what would have occurred otherwise. So that actually is kind of an open issue in some ways. But I can say that we've looked at telecommuting because one question was residential relocation. So if people can telecommute now, will they be motivated to move to that cabin in the Sierras? And they only have to come into the Bay Area once a week or once every other week. Um, but on that one day they commute, they might be traveling longer, you know, making more vehicle miles uh, than commuting five days a week before they started telecommuting and moved so far away. So that's been, an, again, an open question in the field for a while. But from what we can tell, and the studies are relatively sparse, but um, looking at at least salaried employee telecommuters as opposed to self-employed, you know, people who can live anywhere in the world and so forth. But for salaried employees, we've found, yes, they do tend to live farther away from work than average, 
but number one, most often they've moved farther away first and started telecommuting afterwards, so telecommuting is hopefully um, minimizing the impact of a move that they had already made for other reasons, so that makes it kind of a good thing instead of the bad thing that was motivating them to move in the first place. And number two, whichever way the causality goes, it turns out that telecommuters telecommute often enough and for long enough um, that the, their total commute distance traveled is about the same or even a little less than that of commuters who live um, closer to work but commute every day. So um, this one is another one where it's a little bit hard to sort out, but so far, so good. But you know, again, we have lots of other reasons pointing the other direction. So needing to wrap things up pretty quickly, is there any hope? And as I said at the beginning, uh, there are some, but I only have three reasons for hope as opposed to nine for not much hope. <laughs> but I can say that sometimes, yes, ICT does substitute for making a trip. And telecommuting is one of those cases where, um, as far as we can tell, and again, we've looked pretty carefully at non-work trip generation and residential location as best we can, and all the reasons why you know, there might have been a little blowback or you know, counteraction. Um, and as far as we can tell, the benefit of telecommuting is positive, that it does reduce travel on net. Um, what we've now done with a number of aggregate studies, so we've taken a monetary perspective both with consumer expenditure data and looked at relationships between consumer expenditures on transportation and communications. So when a given household spends more on travel, do they tend to spend more on communications or less? Um, and so we've looked at that and controlling for other things, expenditures on other items and so forth. And then we've also looked at it from the industry perspective using input-output analysis. So industries that require more transportation inputs, do they also tend to require more communication inputs or less? Um, and we've then, those are both monetary perspectives. The units are in dollars, basically, or whatever monetary unit you're looking at. But then we've also looked at activity measures, so those kinds of things that I showed the charts about at the beginning, um, number of phone calls and number of vehicle miles traveled by air and ground and so forth, um, and using uh, time series structural equation modeling, and just to show you the little diagram there, so we allowed travel demand to influence uh, telecommunications demand and vice versa, and again controlled for lots of other factors. And all of those stories are basically telling us that complementarity is dominating, that you know, the, the most common impact is that telecommunications and transportation are stimulating each other, um, that transportation is stimulating more telecommunications than the other way around, so there's at least that consolation. But what we often find in these aggregate models are a bunch of sort of insignificant relationships between whatever measure of telecom and whatever measure of travel we're using. And that's telling me that maybe we've got effects in both directions that are canceling out. That yes, we are seeing substitution, and it's helping to cancel out some of the generation effect that we are also seeing. And so my sort of take on that is that, well, maybe without ICT, we would have even worse traffic problems than we do now, if that's any consolation. Um, but then we also have the issue that most of the studies done to date have been basically business as usual kinds of things. So if trends continued as they are now, then here's what we see. But you know, if in cases of extreme events, and actually anecdotally, after every earthquake, hurricane, blizzard, fire, flood, etc., you see the spate of news articles saying, "Oh, isn't it great that we can telecommute and get our work done?" And it's true, it is great, um, and lots of people do it during those times. Um, but it's also true that they seem to go right back to working the same way they always did, i.e. commuting, as soon as the transportation system is fixed or the building is back to normal or whatever. So again, it makes me think that for a lot of these other reasons we've been talking about, people want to commute, need to commute, or, or have to commute, as the case may be. Um, but anyway, we certainly haven't uh, reached the... Uh, you know, the end of our ability to price travel more appropriately, and of course that's a hot topic among transportation economists especially, but planners in general. So were we to increase uh, fuel taxes or congestion pricing, or we were talking earlier about now the proposal to put tolls on even local roads in San Francisco and so forth, um, a carbon tax is being contemplated to deal with the greenhouse gas issue. Um, even, you know, our, the sort of quote-unquote natural experience 
experiment in rising gas prices that we've seen over the last couple of years is also you know, making travel more expensive. And obviously, that could have the effect of stimulating the demand for substitutes for travel with ICT. But I must say that at least with respect to gasoline consumption, the evidence so far is that people are pretty insensitive to the price increases that we've seen. Um, and that, again, for whatever reasons, people uh, either have to travel, want to, or um, anyway, they still are traveling. Um, but ICT can make shared travel modes more attractive. So with respect to public transit, now it is much easier, although still not um, seamless, I must say. Uh, but we can obtain pre-trip information about transit routes, schedules, and even real-time locations and arrivals and so forth, and en route information uh, to give us uh, that comfort feeling. So you know, a big part of the barrier to using transit is uncertainty and lack of information. And the internet has certainly made that more easy, and cell phones uh, as well. Um, so again, the internet has made things like real-time ride sharing. We were talking about picking people up to get the carpool lane on the Bay Bridge. That's not necessarily ICT enabled, but um, yeah, there are certainly uh, internet options for doing carpool formation. And car sharing, per se, is also um, coming into its own with ICT enablement, definitely. And we've already seen earlier the ways in which um, ICT can decrease the disutility of travel, as we say in transportation, um, by making the travel time more productive or enjoyable. And that is a competitive advantage for transit over automobiles, since our hands are free um, with public transit, um, and theoretically are not with the automobile. Um, but the challenge is that you know the very same technological advances that give you know, public, uh, well, first of all, that uh, make ICT a substitute for travel, also, you know, create synergies with travel and make it easier to stimulate more travel. So again, you know, the easier it is to find people on the internet, um, yeah, it can save me from having to go see them, but it may also prompt me to go see them in many cases. And certainly the same mechanisms that make you know, public transit more attractive to some extent can also be used to make driving more attractive. You can believe that the automobile manufacturers are making the car more networked and putting the internet access at least in the back seat, if not the front seat, and you know, all of those things. So here's again sort of a sinister example. It's not just a laptop. It's having your driver circle the building a few more times while you send a few more emails. So, OK, this is probably a minority kind of experience here. Um, but still, they're advertising it as if people actually do this. Uh, and in any case, it's an example of yeah, the ease of ICT communication certainly, again, reduces our motivation to minimize our travel. So I think we have to face the fact that ICT is not just a part of the solution, but it's very much a part of the problem as well, if you want to look at it that way. And frankly, though, if you think about a dual nature for ICT, I also see a dual nature for travel. Um, I see it very much as a two-sided phenomenon. Yes, it's got all those negative externalities that we spend a lot of time and money trying to mitigate. But as we've already seen earlier, it actually is a good thing in many ways. And um, we will pay a price when we try to curtail travel. Um, so I think our challenge is to um, try to find ways to mitigate those negative externalities while retaining many of the benefits. So as a final slide, I'm hoping that we can agree that, first of all, providing alternatives to travel that are attractive is a good thing, and that making the transportation system more efficient is a good thing, so that to the extent travel is necessary, we can accommodate it more effectively. Um, and it is clear that ICT has a major role to play in both of those activities. So um, ICT certainly merits public policy support for its ability to um, uh, improve travels, shall we say. I think we just need to be clear-eyed about the extent to which it's going to replace or substitute for travel. So that's my slides. Um, there's the references. And any questions, I'm happy to entertain. I'm, I'm fascinated with this concept of an alternative to travel that would actually be so attractive and compelling that people would choose not to travel. Right. And I'm wondering if it has to do with meaningful connection or satisfying relationships or whatever it is. And maybe people are finding more of that when they can get off onto their own clock, into their own vibe, 
that they're more connected with their intuition, and what would it be like if we were to do that in our workplaces? Hmm. <laughs> well, not my area per se, but <laughs> um, you know, to the extent workplace is a desirable place to be socially, as it clearly is for many people, that again reduces the desire to telecommute. So um, I think the social interaction of the workplace is quite a factor in, in many people's decision to do it or not do it. If you think about a single adult, you know, who wants to stay at home all day and be bored. Um, so, you know, the, the workplace fulfills not just a professional interaction need, but a social one. Can the internet, um, you know, help uh, provide that? And in some ersatz way, yeah, right, again, in a virtual sense. But I think for the most part, where possible, people are going to prefer the authentic alternative. I was enjoying it. We'll talk. Thank you. I'm glad we're all here. But I have three questions. One of them. One of them is why did you not telecommute in this conference or this talk? Uh -huh. What are your reasons? Uh, the other one is you mentioned um, a real time ride sharing. And I find that the, the infrastructure we have in place works against it very much so. For example, in Orinda, not far from here, used to be a very informal, very functional carpooling setup that BART shut down because they were losing revenue. <laughs> so they were not working with us. They were, they were trying to preserve their own functionality and their own right. mini, mini world. Um, I guess the third question had to do with, um, I lost my train of thought, but maybe I'll, if you answer the first, you'll... Okay, because I can't handle three at once either. <laughs> uh, why did I come in person for the very reasons that we were talking about? Um, if I were video conferencing, it would seem like all of the work and not much of the fun. It, it is more fun to be here in person, and the traffic wasn't that bad. So, And I have a Prius, and it's still fun. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm still... And I enjoy traveling for its own sake, so I listen to my genre. Pierre and Paul and you know kick back and um, yeah Bart well you know some transportation agencies still think they're in the business of transportation by their mode as opposed to providing mobility whether virtual or you know facilitating people to travel by some other mode including carpooling so yeah I think it's unfortunate when they sort of work at cross purposes far better to you know, rising tide lifts all ships, I think, and the more we can effectively use the system, the better. So is that a governmental thing or is it lack of coordination between transit agencies and everybody else, or what is, what is, the, what is the problem there that, that, that is get, get getting in the way of getting things to go in the natural positive direction of, you know, real time? You know, I have to admit I'm not uh, intimately familiar with the local transportation planning scene, but my guess is that there's a lot of silo building, and uh, there certainly is in general in transportation agencies, and in the Bay Area you have a multiplicity of agencies that, again, don't always coordinate. So, uh, you know, it may or may not be um, deliberate. It may simply be ineptness, as one of somebody said. You know, never chalk up to malice what can be attributed to sheer stupidity. Uh, <laughs> it's probably a good working assumption, <laughs> uh, but the end result, of course, is the okay. same. And <laughs> so the last question I had was was, uh, was the ride sharing. You mentioned real time ride sharing. I'm not aware of any official methods of that being in place. Can you tell, tell us about those? Um, as far as I know, there are some experimental ones, but I'm also not aware of any sort of that are operational at, at some for some time. They, they've actually played with them as early as 1980s. Um, obvious issues with respect to safety and privacy and so forth, but you know the fact that we have the real time, uh, the slugs as we call it, you know the picking up the third person in your car to cross the Bay Bridge and the carpool lane. Some people are comfortable picking up total strangers, and the culture has emerged um, in that context that uh, people feel relatively safe doing it, and there's the whole you know, uh, set of rules of you know, conduct and so forth. Uh, so I think at some level, the, the ride sharing, and especially, say, if it's employer-based, you may feel more comfortable doing real-time ride sharing with somebody you live, uh, work with and so forth. So. Um, if you're interested, I can double check and see what experiments are out there and, and get you linked up, but um, yeah, okay. Yes, thank you for your talk. Um, these would appear to be uh, <clears throat> universally applicable experiences, but are they in fact, if one were to try to study this in Japan, Europe, or other third world countries, would you get the same kind of uh, uh, synergy or 
so forth. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So how um, transferable is this to other cultures and countries? Uh, well, certainly the face-to-face -face culture is far more important in Japan and, and Asian countries, as far as I know, than here. So that's been inhibiting telecommuting there in a place where they have much, uh, you know, more stringent, uh, much more difficult transportation problems, if you will. They also tend to have much smaller homes. But um, again, several years ago, decade and a half, Japan was already experimenting with telecommuting centers. So you would have a facility close to home. You wouldn't have to work at home. Um, as the saying goes, the spouse says, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. You know, get out of the house. Um, so they had the infrastructure, but again, it was not a very popular. And in fact, <laughs> the odd thing in Japan was, you know, whereas in the US, the managers are going to want the video conferencing capability to see that the worker is really working. In Japan, it was the other way around. They wanted to see the, the main office and, and feel connected somehow back to the, to the main location. So there's wrinkles. There's, you know, cultural sort of differences in, in that respect. I think the basic principles are probably applicable. I mean, one of, one of my research goals is to explore this positive utility of travel idea in various cultures, and I've nibbled at it but not really done it seriously. Um, I think at some level it's a fundamental human need, but with variations um, that will differ from culture to culture. So we have time for one more question. Uh, you alluded to a few other possibilities. One is that the automobile operator is used as ICT simultaneously and causes dangers and therefore reduce the traffic because of accidents. Two, the uh, travel people are putting the sensors in the highways to determine what the traffic is. And, and it seems to me that they could then turn on or off the diamond lanes. And, and three, the, the red light uh, cameras are cause accident, reduce the side impact accidents, but cause rear end accidents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the other possibility is to then change the, free, the, the the light timing to increase traffic flow. Right. Yeah, I mean, you point to a whole host of issues, um, all of which I don't dispute. Um, you know, ICT can certainly speed things up, as with uh, signal timing and uh, ramp metering and so forth. Um, but yeah, again, there's, in terms of implementation, often these unexpected uh, downsides, like the rear end collisions with the traffic cameras. There's, I read something that suggests that might dissipate as people get used to the camera being there. You can imagine after it's initially installed, there's an adjustment period where people are, you know, changing their behavior. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure if there was a question or mainly a comment. The other one is, yeah. the, the, the other one, important one, is simultaneously driving and using ICT. Oh yeah, well I'm totally opposed. <laughs> but again, I might be in the minority on that. Um, but yeah, it's clearly, uh, I mean there's all kinds of studies now that inattention of various kinds, I mean we're now focusing on the cell phone, but now they're saying, well is it any different than talking to somebody next to you or playing with the radio or, and, and just the whole information rich environment there, the, the na in vehicle navigation system, which is supposed to again help you find your way and reduce being lost. and, and and improve travel and so forth, but if you're looking at it and not the road. And so there are clear human factors issues in our ability to process these ICTs. Okay. Well, thank you, Professor Mokhtarion. If everybody could skip. <laughs> and we'll have this again next week. Thank you.